Test, test, test. Good evening, Manhattan, New York City, the world, the universe, and beyond. Uh, we're getting ready to go live in about 20 seconds. And tonight we're going to talk about uh, sociopaths, psychopaths, narcissists, and gaslighters. If you don't know what any of those are, uh, my name's Kirk, and all things spiritual, supernatural, mystical, and magical. And we are about to go live out to uh, an uncountable number of people. Uh, live from New York City right now, actually, and live. Good evening, Manhattan, New York City, the world, the universe, and beyond. My name is Kirk, and this is my spiritual, supernatural, mystical, and magical TV show. And we're here every Monday night, 11.30 p.m. Eastern. And uh, we also broadcast personally uh, videos on Daily Motion, Vimeo, YouTube, and the Internet Archive. You just type in Kirk is a Shaman, New York City, Kirk Spiritual Television, and Kirk TV, and Kirk's Strange Universe, because we've been here uh, 15 years. Uh, broadcasting live here out of Studio 4, and uh, we're happy to be here. Uh, it's uh, heading into February of 2019. It's about 20 degrees outside. That's why I'm wearing a hat here. And uh, I also just got a very tight, very tight haircut. And just give me one second to see if we're going live. We're just basically going to show you some videos and we're going to ask the question, hey, what's the difference between a psychopath, a sociopath, a narcissist, and a gaslighter? And just kind of like a regular person that's like really being an asshole okay there's our sound check and everything looks good we're actually going out live you can actually watch me uh any monday live on your cell phone as well so now that we know the sound is going good and everything's going good uh what do you guys want to talk about Everybody has probably been affected by a sociopath, a psychopath, a narcissist, or a gaslighter. Now, if you go online here, okay, and uh, you kind of just type in like, hey, what's a gaslighter? Kirk, what's a gaslighter? Let's just see. Okay. Uh, so we're going to type in uh, what is a gaslighter for those of you who may or may not know we've done shows about it before what is a gaslighter okay and uh eight signs that some that you're in a relationship with a gaslighter 11 warning signs psychology today so you know it's it's kind of a hot topic actually gaslighting uh versus but what's the difference and it is really becoming like a, a, a pretty modern sociological, psychological term with people in the mental health field. You know, you could say, hey, my, my brother was gaslighting me, my stepmother, stepfather gaslighted me, uh, my parent gaslighted me. Oh, man, always, uh, it's not Kirk's spiritual television if I don't run over the, uh, the cord here. There we go. And I do this like almost every show. <laughs> my name's Kirk. Welcome to my show. I'm an interdimensional shamanic healer. And uh, I do something called soul retrieval and spirit mending for clients. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can go on over to kirkspiritual.com. And uh, I'm just, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you. I'm uh, kind of happy to be mentally healthy enough to get out of the house and have my own TV show. And uh, I am a therapist of sorts, and I do help people, but I'm not a conventional helper. I'm kind of like a very unconventional person uh, in the ther mental health therapy field. I'm a shamanic healer. I do soul retrieval, spirit mending. And uh, if you'd like to know more about what I do, like I said, I'm on all social media, Instagram. Uh, maybe we can do a little thing where I can show you a little bit of it. So let's see. I promise not to run over the mic again. Uh, so we're going to go to videos about gaslighting. 
and some of it call some people call it narc abuse actually instead of uh, gaslighting you can also now there it's a very in vogue to say to shorten narcissist to narc and say you know you've been a victim of narc abuse and uh, so if you go on to uh, let's see go on to YouTube there's tons of stuff uh, let me see uh, how to respond to a partner who gaslighted you when you're being manipulated so why don't we try uh, Facebook uh, excuse me YouTube and see uh, like you could type in narc abuse <laughs> You've never seen a mold of damage like this before. Uh, okay, narc abuse. No one understands. Narc abuse. Uh, why the new supply is... I don't know what that is. Uh, how narcissists use projection to destroy you. So you've got a lot of personal videos, and then you've got some people in the mental health field. Eight signs you're suffering from narcissistic abuse syndrome. Narc abuse, don't give up. Uh, why abuse victims, Ben's watch, narcissism. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's classic YouTube stuff. Everybody's, oh, here's one. Maybe we should just watch this. I didn't have it in our regular I'm lineup. Uh, but as soon as the ad passes, we will, uh, we'll watch this one. It's only four minutes long. What do you say about that? And the title is, let's see. Five signs of narcissistic abuse. What is covert narcissistic abuse? Are you a victim? Mind games. Nobody enjoys being played, but narcissists enjoy playing them. They enjoy the game of cat and mouse and seek honorable victim. But more often than not, people who are prone to being taken advantage of by narcissists overlook their innocent facades. In fact, they often make excuses for them, even when they're being poorly mistreated by their toxic behavior. Why is this? Because narcissists aren't always obvious. They disguise themselves by being charmingly covert. Here are five dangerous signs you're being abused by a covert narcissist. One, they minimize your needs. Do you feel like you're giving more than you're receiving? What about feeling small when you're around them? Covert narcissists have a sneaky way of getting inside people's heads and making you believe like you're responsible for everything. They rarely take fault and even when they do apologize, they do it sparingly and without meaning just to get you to forgive them. They don't care for facts or logic, only what they want to hear or believe that benefits them. Recognize that what you need is important too, so don't always yield for their benefits. Two, they forget that you exist. Being passionate about a hobby or a career is an attractive trait, but there's a fine line between passion and obsession. If your friend or romantic partner often ignores you or cancels plans with you to focus on their favorite activities, then it's a sign that they just don't care about you. Being understanding and open-minded, you probably always make up excuses for them. You frequently say things like, well, they worked hard to get where they are today, so I'm gonna be supportive, or there's always next week, what's the rush? But this is exactly how they have you wrapped around their finger. Don't let them have the upper hand and emphasize your boundaries. Three, they project false humility. Do they often cry to you and put themselves down, saying they aren't good enough or feel misunderstood? Before believing them, recognize that this is a trap. Covert narcissists like to play the victim card and feel like people never understand them enough. They might be highly sensitive individuals who say things like, if only people could understand how smart I am, or why don't others appreciate who I am? They love surrounding themselves with those who can boost their ego. It's better not to give in and dish out less compliments. Four, they never approach you first and wait for you to come to them. Covert narcissists feel a sense of entitlement. They believe that they should be appreciated and noticed first by others before giving someone attention in return. They dislike being in a group full of people, unless all eyes and talk are on them. If you find yourself constantly putting in all the work and go to them first, then you've become their little puppet. Stand up for yourself and show them that you don't have all the time in the day to serve them. You're better than that. Five, they seem annoyed when you come to them with your problems. Are you the reliable friend? Okay, or you can, can check all these out on YouTube and you can dead. watch but them like too. almost ad nauseum. Some of them are really good and some of them are just really bad. But, uh, and, you know, you have a lot of people saying that they were 
victims of narcissistic abuse or narc abuse. So, uh, scared of love because of narc abuse. You have people talking about it. Uh, and, you know, you have some professional videos, obviously. And then you have, uh, you know, just random people. Uh, so, here you go. Um, so, tonight, we're not going to watch any, quote, unquote, narc, narc abuse. We're going to watch and find out and ask and talk about what's the difference between a uh, a psychopath first a psychopath and a sociopath the psychologist I can't remember uh, Romani Durvasula and she's got a PhD in psychology and I watch her videos she's really great and this is the one video I wanted to show you tonight and she, you know, she just talks very candidly and calmly about the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath. Basically, though, psychopaths are born and sociopaths and narcissists or gaslighters are created. They're created either by a family situation. Uh, the jury's out whether or not they're born. So modern psychology will basically say more often than not, the psychopath is born that way. and There's nothing you can really do to change it. You know, and they're spotting them and trying to spot them quicker and quicker. Uh, you know, not all psychopaths become serial killers. And not all psychopaths, you can really tell, they don't look like psychopaths. So, we're just going to watch some of this, and it's about 12 minutes long. And I'm going to show you the whole thing, and it's a really great. A psychopath and a narcissist. So, here you go, Would guys. You answer this intense question is Dr. Romani. Help us out here. Well, it's, you know, again, there's a lot of overlap, but the fact is a lot of people are using these terms interchangeably. Mm. They, and they should they be? No, they no. shouldn't. They're okay. different things, okay? One rule of thumb to remember right off the bat, every psychopath is narcissistic, but not every narcissist is psychopathic. Make sense? There, there's, there's your key difference. A narcissist is somebody who lacks empathy, is grandiose, is entitled, is constantly seeking validation, is arrogant. Um, it's a disorder of self-esteem and they have trouble regulating their self-esteem. But when a narcissist does a bad thing, they feel a fair amount of guilt and shame. More shame than guilt, frankly, because they're concerned about how other people view them. Shame is a public emotion. So they don't like being viewed negatively in the public eye or by other people. That's where the shame comes from. But they'll feel a little bad. Like if they cheat on their wife, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Psychopaths are a different animal. They're all of those things except no guilt, no shame. Wow. They don't feel remorse when they do something bad. Wow. So they're, they're great um, serial killers. Oh hired assassins, um, people who are going to go in and literally sort of gut a business. These are your guys. They're like, I don't, I don't care who gets hurt. They'd say that and they'd mean it. Okay, where a narcissist is like, I hope no one gets hurt. Okay? The difference between the psychopath and the sociopath is the one where most people get confused because the sociopath is a lot like the psychopath. They do bad things and they don't care. Okay? Here's the key difference. A psychopath is born and a sociopath is made. Mm. Okay, that's the key. So a psychopath, in fact, we know in the research on psychopathy, which has also been called antisocial personality disorder in our diagnostic manual, these are people who are actually believed to have slightly different autonomic nervous systems. Our autonomic nervous system is actually that part that holds our sympathetic nervous system, which is our fight and flight system. So when our autonomic nervous system for a normal person gets charged up, which it would if we broke a rule if we did something embarrassing or rude, if we ran through a red light, our heart starts racing. Mm -hmm. We sweat, our, our pupils get wide, we look around because we're afraid of the consequence. A psychopath doesn't have that same kind of arousal. That's why they're able to lie on lie detector tests. That's how they get away with it. They don't have that same kind of arousal. So where you or I may go on a roller coaster, feel that sense of excitement, we need to get that arousal in a good way. We don't like feeling it when we do something wrong. They don't feel it. So they do they get stressed? No, not in the same way. So if they're driving, because mm -hmm. if I'm driving mm -hmm. and I see police sirens coming behind me, I mean, it is a full on, oh, oh yeah. my gosh, I can't believe I'm going to get pulled over. But a psychopath would see that and go, oh, I'm going to get pulled over. Well, this could be, they could have a dead body in the trunk and they wouldn't, 
they wouldn't change. And so they pull time. over, they get the ticket, and they don't care. No, they don't care. And they pay the ticket? If And maybe not. They'll even probably get an attorney to get them off or say, yeah, you know, my understanding of your state laws is you can't really be doing this. And they'll be cool as can be. And this is this is a, a difference in their they're actually their how makeup. the nervous systems are wired and their brains are. There's actually been interesting research done with PET scans where you can see brain function and what not just shown, to clarification, not pet like dogs and cats, PET, PET yeah, scans. Yes. Emission tomography scans yes. of the brain which show brain functioning, if you will. And what they see is that the the section of the brain that serves empathy, that doesn't naturally light up in them. And you can actually teach them to be empathic for a minute, but it doesn't last. A lot of psychopaths who commit violent crimes end up in jail. And the ones who commit more like white collar crimes, I guess they end up as multi-billionaires <laughs> because they're willing to do really, really rough stuff in their business and get through like a cartel leader or something like that. Call for the killings of other people. Now, they're interesting um, counterpart are the sociopaths. Psychopaths born, they tend to, that their belief is that they may very well have, this might be genetic. In fact, psychopaths often have fathers who have lots of antisocial tendencies. Now, how much of it is learned, how much of it is genetic, it's a little bit harder to suss out, but we do see that there is that difference in your true psychopath. They also tend to be, have really glib, shallow charm. They tend to be really intelligent. That's why they get away with stuff. If they were So they've, really they've learned mess. behavior to yeah. assimilate into society. Oh yeah. But there is, it's all a facade. It's all a facade, they're so charming. So if they're born this way, would a three-year-old then not get stressed out if it got no. scared? So uh, that's incredible. So what we see when we diagnose antisocial personality disorder, which is sort of our diagnostic equivalent of being a psychopath, in order to get that diagnosis, you have to have shown a pattern prior to the age of 15 of things like truancy, violence towards other kids, stealing, skipping school. And not felt bad animals, about it. Setting fires. They just do it. They don't care. And that before the age of 15, so it's a long-standing pattern. That's what makes us call them a psychopath or having antisocial personality. Now, this is different than sociopathy. Yes, okay. Sociopathy, they look a lot like the psychopaths. The difference is they were made. So this, some examples here. The kid who grows up in a really, 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 really rough neighborhood and learns criminality to get by or learns to be a bully or like, you know, gets involved with sort of like the wrong kids and uses a lot of muscle because that's survivalism. But they, they it's not necessarily always comfortable for them. They just learn it. It's the person who grows up with a father who teaches them the business and teaches them how to break the rules. Um, they, he may but not they, they don't, they would, would they feel, would they start sweating and have their heart race they if might. they got pulled over? They might. They may, may not feel so good about it. They'll be a little bit more uncomfortable with it, but in time they learn it. And that, that what, it's almost like they, they get trained in not being as aroused by it. Listen, if you broke enough rules, if you lived under certain conditions of lawlessness long enough, you'd adjust to that new world order, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. That's what the sociopath does. Mm -hmm. And so they're the person, someone who said he was actually a great kid until he got to high school. And then it seems like he got in with the wrong kids. That feels more like the sociopath. Wow. Okay, that's almost like a training that might happen from at the, in, within the family, within their community, within even the job they get, some cases even within some form of military training. Have you had sociopaths and psychopaths as clients? Mm, not really, no. no. They don't come to, tend to come in for therapy. They, they don't see any benefit to it. The only time you would tend to see psychopaths or sociopaths come into therapy with any consistency is if they were court ordered. So I thought you, you were going to say um, couples therapy. No, God, no. No, no. They, it, okay, uh, order, if you so tuned the in, we just are uh, watching this within great interview with, with Romani. Uh, I can't say her last name. Uh, but uh, she's got like four videos on YouTube. And she's got uh, videos like, let's see if it'll show up on the sideboard. Here you go. You got... Uh, Four types of narcissism, and uh, so she's got a great video about this, and uh, let's see, these are the signs you are dating a narcissist. Let's try this Narcissist. One. Now we're going to talk about the four different types of narcissists. Oops. Dr. Romani, thanks for being back here with us. Thanks for this having me. This topic is so fascinating, especially 
Being in Los Angeles, which I feel like might be the narcissistic capital of the world. You know what I said to someone once? I said, you want to study tortoises? Work in the Galapagos. You want to study narcissism? Live in Los Angeles. I mean, it is it is rampant here. Yes, it is rampant. I, I think so, at least. Yeah. Um, before we get into those four types, quick question. In your estimation, what percentage of the population is narcissistic? Yeah, it's a tough one because, again, it's a trait, right? It's not like a disorder where right. we could actually do an interview or figure it out. Uh, it's, it's, you know, if I were to hazard a guess, like people who are noticeably narcissistic, where you're like, oh, you know, I would put that number probably to 10 to 15 percent. Wow. By no means do I think it's a majority. When you think of your own friends, most of them are sane, good, empathic, mm -hmm. kind people. But I do think that at 10 to 15 percent, that's a lot of people. Now, again, I'm sort of pulling that number out of the air. It's, it's just a difficult, it's a difficult statistic to get. Not to mention that the measurement skills we have are not very good. Right. Yeah. But to think even if you're in a room of 20 people, one to two of them easily actually would be classified as narcissistic. And it depends on what kind of room. Like, you know, if you're <laughs> sort of like an entertainment <laughs> industry effect, I'm going 50%. You know, but if you're, you know, or you're like a lawyer banker meeting or yeah, something like a that. A little higher. But I don't know if you're at some sort of like a community volunteer meeting, probably one to two is more. Very good likely. point. Yeah. So I was shocked to find out that there is not just a blanket term narcissism or narcissistic. There's actually four different categories yeah. for this. Let's talk about them. Yeah, if you look at the research, and this is definitely, as I've gone over the years looking at what's been written, I really do think that four primary types have emerged. They're sort of our classical grandiose narcissists. That's sort of like the, I don't know, the, the Chanel suit of mm -hmm. narcissism. It's the classic representation of the person who's sort of very egotistical, arrogant, um, attention-seeking, validation-seeking, look at me, I'm so great, don't I have a beautiful house, they don't stop to listen to anybody. Again, your garden variety grandiose narcissist, okay? Far more problematic is the malignant narcissist. This is the person who is all the things the grandiose narcissist is, lacking empathy, entitled, and grandiose, and big, and pompous, but they're also really mean. Oh. They will do really bad things. They almost feel like they're a little bit psychopathic. They often won't even feel that bad, maybe a little bit guilty, but not like, really. What do you mean they do bad things? Um, they will steal money from a company. They will cheat on their partner. Oh, like really they, bad like things. Like really bad things. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not taking like saying like take more peppermints than they should from like, Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. No, 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 yeah. no, no. I'm talking like big ticket bad. And they'll, they'll lie. They cheat. They steal. These are your Bernie Madoff types. Wow. You know, like really malignant. They just sort of they they make great criminals you know and again when we could talk about it at some point there's a difference between a psychopath and a narcissist by and large a narcissist even a malignant narcissist will feel a little bad about doing some things especially feel bad if they've hurt other people in their circle so if they do bad things they'll be sorry they hurt their family but they often won't really care about other victims that mm. kind of thing mm -hmm. so that's your malignant narcissist then there are some other types of narcissism that people don't don't realize and like, oh, that makes so much more sense. The key one in, in that one is called covert narcissism. Covert is a word that means secret, really. So a covert narcissist is somebody who is very sort of put upon by the world, but they're still grandiose. So they, they'll say things like, yeah, like, you know, I'm a really great photographer, but the world never really noticed my greatness. I guess I just came up at the wrong time. And all these cameras you guys use now, it's easy now, but back when I was taking pictures, I could have been one of the great ones. Are, is a covert narcissist. narcissist older? Uh, they can be, but not necessarily. Okay. They often feel like life done them wrong. Mm. They can be quite passive aggressive. Mm. Um, they, you know, they're that person. They're just, they always feel, they almost feel depressed. And in fact, more than a few of us will initially think the covert narcissist has depression wow. and will treat them for depression. We're like, this is not getting better and it has been 10 months. Even if they're on meds by now, something should have happened. So someone who has been classified as a mm -hmm. covert narcissist mm -hmm and then treated for depression, 
will not show improvement. In if they're depressed, they'll show some improvement Correct. in their depression, but they'll still walk around like, woe is me. Wow. Why doesn't anyone see how great I am? I do so many great things for the world, and I guess it wasn't my time. And you know, and they, they'll be very vulnerable. If somebody said, they're very hypersensitive to criticism. So if somebody says, yeah, those pictures were good, but we're not going to be able to hang them up in our gallery. Uh, what? You're, you're, uh, and they'll throw a tantrum. They'll become really cold. They'll become distant. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not coming to your gallery opening. My yeah. pictures weren't good enough for yeah. you. That's the covert. Kind of like the. Uh, I'm not fired, I quit. Yes, exactly. They really do feel like the world never got their greatness. Wow. That's the covert narcissist. Yeah, there's a lot of those in there's Los Angeles. There's a lot of that. And then that often gets missed as, well, no, they're not even that confident. I'm like, yeah. no, listen. They yeah. really, it's always like nobody gets how great I am. So I know there's a fourth one, but before we go into that, mm -hmm. let's dive into that. How, how would I know, mm -hmm. as I'm not a clinical yeah. mm -hmm. you know, psychologist, how would I know if my friend or this person needs confidence, needs a boost, or if they're a covert narcissist. Look at how victimy they feel. Mm. You know, like how much like, ah, oh, no one gets me or nobody gets how great I am. It's because it's always in a sense of, it's nobody quite gets their excellence. There's sort of an arrogance to them. Versus yes. a person who really is like, nah, this is, I did not do a good job on this pie. I know I could do better. Can I, let me give it another shot. So there's almost like this sense of efficacy, the word that means like, I'm gonna give it a, I'm gonna give it a try. I recognize what I did wrong. They often won't take ownership. The covert narcissist will say, I see what my part was in this. I see why it didn't go right. The covert narcissist will blame the world. That's They'll very say, clear. You know, that the world is to blame for why I did not succeed. All right, what is our fourth the type? The fourth one is a oh. fascinating one. I read an article about this and I was like, I, I was like, you know, rarely do scientific articles get you as excited as I'm running around the university saying, you've got to read this. Oh my gosh, I love it's it. called the communal narcissist. Communal. Communal. The communal narcissist is that person, for example, all over their social media feed is like, off to feed the homeless today, but they're like really well made up or like, it's dog rescue Thursday. And they're always out there trying to save the world. They go to galas and they go to benefits and they write big checks, but they need a lot of recognition. They need a lot of like, can we name this after you? Can we name that after you? They okay say, guys, uh, we're gonna, gonna have to wrap like, it up tonight. I hope to like see you here next Monday. But like, they're so all let's uh, just, if you want to, uh, once again, see any of my social media, speaking of narcissists, uh, Kirk is a shaman. You just type that in and you want to get a hold of me. Let's see, Kirk Shaman. Uh, shaman. And you can type in New York City and spiritual. And you can watch a lot of past shows. Here we go. Here's my website, Kirk Spiritual Healing. I offer a variety of healing arts services. And, uh, you know, I have over around 300 videos online for you to check out. So, you know, you could see any of these. Uh, and I do have some interviews as well. Uh, if you ever want to watch any of those. There we go. Here's an older video. So that's it, guys. If you want to talk to me, send me an email at kirktv at gmail.com. And if you want to watch any past episodes, just type in Kirk Spiritual Shaman, New York City. And they're on Vimeo, Internet Archive. Daily Motion, and a lot of links on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay, guys, a little shocked in Namaste, and I'll see you next week in the Cyber Temple of Love. Thanks for watching. It's been my honor to be your host tonight and every night. And uh, if you want to send me an email, it's kirktv at gmail.com. All righty, thanks for watching, and... Let's see, we'll end up with this, Compulsive and then we'll take, you do uh, take it home. to get what you want? If you answered yes to all Thanks of these for watching, questions, guys. you might want to consult a professional who can determine if you are a sociopath or a psychopath.
Both sociopaths and psychopaths share three common traits suggested by the questions above. Conceitedness, deceitfulness, and manipulation largely unchecked by moral conscience. Some experts think that sociopathy and psychopathy are the same and group them together under the diagnostic term antisocial personality disorder, or APD, while others argue that there are significant differences between the two mental disorders. We'll examine some of these differences in this episode of The Infographic Show, Sociopath vs. Psychopath. The outward behavior that sociopaths and psychopaths display can be as different as night and day. Sociopaths are more impulsive and irresponsible than psychopaths. As psychologist Scott Bond notes, sociopaths tend to live on the fringes of society. They often can't hold down a job for long and can't settle down in one place. They may travel extensively, but they are not sightseers. If they can't find legitimate work to pay for whatever they need, they may do shady things like lie, cheat, and steal from people along the way. Renowned con man Charles Ponzi lived in this manner. Ponzi immigrated from Italy to America in 1903. He supposedly said, I landed in this country with $2.50 in cash and $1 million in hopes, and those hopes never left me. According to the New England Historical Society, $2.50 was all that he had left after having gambled and drunk away most of the $200 he had with him on board the ship taking him to America. After arriving in Boston, he spent several years working odd jobs